Many see the idea of absolute truth as offensive. They adopt the notion that truth can be whatever they want it to be, and the gospel as a result is seen as narrow-minded. So where do we find courage to proclaim the truth of Scripture? That's our subject today on Truth For Life, as Alistair Begg continues our series called Useful to the Master. We're in 2 Timothy chapter 1, verses 1 to 14. All of us in the journey of life are being helped on by those who are ahead and presumably are encouraging others who are alongside and behind us. Fred Mitchell, who preached from this same place years ago, in one of his memorable little uh, doggerel, says, You can never lead souls heavenward unless climbing yourself. You need not be very high up, but you must be climbing. And as Paul continues to climb, he encourages Timothy to climb along with him. What are the constituent elements, then, of his urging him along the path of faith? Let me suggest to you that they are four. Number one, faithful in prayer. That's verse 3. I constantly remember you. Number 2, warm in friendship. That's verse 4. Number 3, verse 5, encouraging in his words. And I want to be, he says, purposeful in my exhortation. In light of this, he says, for this reason, I want to remind you to fan into flame the gift of God that is in you. Now, these verses contain a wonderful and necessary reminder of the benefits and blessings of a Christian heritage. From infancy, Timothy had been acquainted with the Scriptures. We'll see that in verse 15 of chapter 3. And I stand to testify this morning to the immense privilege and benefit that it is to have been reared in that kind of environment. The benefit of a godly grandmother from the highlands of Scotland, who prayed for me from conception or prior to, of a mother who loved Christ and nurtured me, father too, but it's grandmother and mother here will just stay with the flow. I want just to say in passing a word to you godly grannies. You're at the forefront of things. You're at the very knife edge of things laying hold of God's throne for your grandchildren who are growing up in an age of confusion, who many of them are taking on board great chunks of confused thinking and bizarre living. And eternity will reveal the impact of your prayers, even if you don't see it in time. So to praying grandmothers and praying mothers, pray on. Now, Timothy had not only been reared in a godly environment and befriended by a mighty apostle, but he had also been endowed with spiritual gifts. And that's why in verse 6 and following, Paul gives him the exhortation, fan into flame the gift of God which is in you. I'm inclined to agree with the view of verse 6 that maintains that what Paul is referring to here is simply the authority and power to be a minister of Christ. It may be more than that. I certainly do not believe it is less than that. What is this gift of God which is in you through the laying on of my hands? The average home Bible study group can stop here for a fortnight as everybody debates it and dialogues over it and nobody knows what it is. But it doesn't stop the group from stopping, you know. And the tea's going cold and people are leaving and folks are pontificating on what it is. Well, my best shot at it is that it is the authority and power of Christ to be a minister of Christ. It may be something different. But this, you see, was the necessary reminder. Timothy is frail. Timothy is timid. Therefore, it seems only right that he would be encouraged to fan this into a flame. This wonderful balance between what God does and what we do. The power necessary to fulfill the exhortations of Scripture is supplied to us in the Spirit. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, Philippians 2.12, for it is God who is at work in you, both to will and to do of his good pleasure. Fan into flame the gift of God which is in you, because God didn't give us a spirit of timidity, but a spirit of power and of love and of self-discipline. You see, if if the sentence had ended simply fan into flame the gift of God, Timothy might have sat there and said, you know, I've been trying to do that and I haven't been making much of a go of it. What am I supposed to do? After all, look at me. And then comes the reminder of the resources. 
Now, we have to be very careful of this notion of power, don't we? For God did not give us a spirit of timidity, but a spirit of power. This is not the power of personality. It's not the power of persuasive speech. It's not the power of human boldness. Paul, when he writes to the Corinthians in 2 Corinthians 4, he says to them, We have this treasure in earthen vessels, so that the glorious power might be seen to be from God and not from us. When he writes to the Corinthians in his first letter, he is so concerned that he doesn't press home his abilities and his background. And his desire in relationship to this is in order that the power of God might rest on them and that they might trust and their confidence might be in the power of God rather than on the wisdom of man. And at a generation and at a time when there is so much made of being powerful and being useful and so on, let us remind ourselves that it is axiomatic throughout all of Scripture that it is an awareness of our inadequacy and an awareness of our frailty and often of our fearfulness that is the environment in which we make the discovery of God's endowment. So that the very things we run from trials are the means of God's blessing. The very thing that we try and cover up in ourselves, our weakness and our diffidence and our lack of giftedness, is the very foundation that God uses to magnify his Son. And our endeavor to make much of ourselves or to let people know how powerful we are or how useful we might be is the very denial of the experience of that which God longs to give to his children. And along with power, love, which is a vital prerequisite in a servant of the Lord Jesus Christ. Surely and hopefully as life goes by, the older we get, the more we understand this in ministering to one another. That there are more flies caught by a jar of honey, as Spurgeon said, than by a bottle of vinegar. Some of us have got the vinegar face and the vinegar ministry, you know. We wouldn't be described as a honeypot. <laughs> Certainly not by our wives. <laughs> you're a pastor here today. Do your people know you love them? I don't mean that in some kind of buy yourself a teddy bear, squishy sentimentality. Do your folks know that you love them? By your self-giving to them, by your opening up of the Scriptures to them, by your life amongst them. For that's what God has entrusted to his servants. Not only power in order that we might be useful, but love in order that we might be approachable and self-discipline in order that we might fulfill all the duties of our ministry. You see, the missing element in many of our lives is simply self-discipline. That we are chaotic. And we might make a joke about the average pastor's study but it's unacceptable. And it's often a picture of the individual's life. So, he says, and incidentally, pastors, we always in our preparation should have two words written up beside our Bible, so what? So what? Because that's what our people are asking. They're asking, so what? So what in light of my uh, recent bereavement? So what in light of the challenges of my employment? So what in relationship to my teenage children? So what in relationship to my singleness? So. Now, the application that he makes here is not so much for uh, the what are the implications for us, but what are the implications of this for Timothy? Well, first of all, don't be ashamed. So do not be ashamed. You would think after he'd written all of this that the last thing in the world he would write is do not be ashamed. He's just told them you've got power, you've got love, you've got self-discipline, you've got a godly heritage, you've got good friends, you've got me going for you. You might have thought he said, so preach the word. No, he says, so do not be ashamed. That's a great encouragement to me. I don't know about you. Because it is so easy to be ashamed. To be ashamed of the master, to be ashamed of the master's men, and to be ashamed of the master's message. Do not be ashamed, he says, to testify about our Lord, or ashamed of me, his prisoner. You see, vague talk about religion, vague talk about God, about spirituality, is largely tolerable in a pluralistic culture. What is unacceptable is a clear, humble, unequivocal declaration that there is salvation in no one other than Jesus Christ, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. 
Let me tell you what you can say in a pluralistic culture. I am the way, the truth, and the life. Not a problem. Just don't add the second part of the verse. No one comes to the Father but by me. And in our generation, we can make all kinds of vague and sentimental statements that are loosely akin to the gospel without them being the forceful declaration that the gospel truly is. And when we are prepared to be unashamed and unequivocal, then the word of Paul to Timothy will be a word for us, join with me in suffering for the gospel. What a word this is, and what a strange word to our day. And yet Jesus in Mark 8 says, If anyone is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man will be ashamed of him when he comes in his Father's glory with the holy angels. Now, loved ones, we're going to have to work this out, it seems to me. The invitation that Paul extends here to join in the privilege of suffering for the gospel is not an invitation that will be responded quickly to by the faint-hearted. It, frankly, is a troubling invitation to the triumphalism of so much of our day that seeks to present Christian living in glowing colors always and in powerful and in transcendent ways. And one of the missing elements in evangelicalism, I think, is a well-thought-out theology of suffering. When we sing, I am the Lord that healeth thee, and we want to confirm and affirm the fact of God's power to heal. But both the Bible and human experience tells me that in the vast majority of cases, leaving aside death as the ultimate healing, those for whom we have continued to pray and have claimed, sometimes in outlandish ways, all kinds of promises of God, still suffer from multiple sclerosis, still see through a glass darkly, still are devastated by emotional concerns, and still live in the midst of difficult days. And it is a failure on our part to realize what the Bible says concerning the nature of suffering that leaves us dumbfounded before the questions of our generation. Because our triumphalism isn't true, and then we've nothing left to say. And we don't write songs about heaven anymore because apparently nobody's concerned to go because we're liking it so much down here. And after all, we have apparently brought all that is going to be up there down here if truth were told. So why would you need to go? Why not just stay? You see, we're not telling the truth. Through many dangers, toils, and snares, I have already come. That's the truth. And there are still more to come. Tis grace hath brought me safe thus far, and grace will take me home, you see. That's how he can speak with conviction under the shadow of the guillotine. There's no silly talk from Paul. No bizarre, unrealistic claims. Theological substance that stirs the heart and transforms the life. Now, the only way that we will be able to do this in joining in the suffering of the gospel is, the power, is by the power of God. And it is God who has saved us. And you come to a wonderful section here on the nature of salvation. Let me just run right through it. How have we been saved? Not on account of anything desirable in us, but on the basis of God's own purpose and grace. A grace that was given us in Christ Jesus before the beginning of time. The undeserved favor of God reaches into the eternal counsels of his will. You stay up and drink a lot of coffee and try and work that out. I found a friend, oh, such a friend, he loved me ere I knew him. And he drew me with the cords of love, and thus he bound me to him. And round my heart so closely twined these ties that naught can sever. For I am his, and he is mine forever 
and forever. And where did that begin? In the eternal counsels of his will. What is that? That's the doctrine of election. And where did you get that? Out of the Bible. And how are, to, how are you to use it? Not as a bomb to be dropped. Not as a banner to be waved. But as a bastion for the soul in the midst of difficult and sometimes doubting days. I could never keep my hold. He will hold me fast. What a wonderful truth. What a necessary truth for a young man facing such a prospect in his day. Incidentally, did you like that? Not a bomb to be dropped, not a banner to be waved, but a bastion? It's got a ring of stot to it, hasn't it? <laughs> it was Eric Alexander. <laughs> now, lest any of this should appear to be rarefied theology, Paul shows that the purposes of God are bestowed in the person of Christ, given us in Christ Jesus. That takes you to Titus 2.11, which in the Anglican uh, lectionary is uh, read one of the selected readings for uh, Christmas Day. The grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. The epiphany. What is this grace? How does this grace come to me? If it is in this mysterious way that God has ordained it, how do I meet it? How do I greet it? Well, it comes to us in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. And he is the one who has destroyed death and has brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. What a word for our day. That's the only dirty word that you can't say. Death. That's the only subject you mustn't introduce at a party. Death. But the statistics are in. One out of one dies. <laughs> and people try and distance themselves from it. Nowhere better than America. The folks, when they're dead, look a lot better than when they were alive over there. <laughs> the first time you ever saw them with their glasses cleaned, you know? <laughs> they got a big fountain pen in the front of their pocket. What are they saying? They're trying to say, he's not really away. Yes, he's away. And you'll be away too. Therefore, it's better to go to a house of mourning than to a house of laughter, because in the house of mourning, we will reflect upon this. And who has anything to say to a society that is consumed with death and has no answer? The Christian who knows Christ, who knows that in Jesus there is life and immortality that has been brought to light. We're not simply going to have some kind of soul existence. We're going to have the whole shooting match. Go out and tell people, God's not dead. He is alive. Sounds like a chorus, doesn't it? Now his testimony in verse 11. He says, And it's of this gospel I was appointed a herald, bringing the king's announcement, an apostle, as we've noted, and a teacher to explain and apply the truth. And incidentally, he says, If you think that I'm living in the Holiday Inn and getting picked up in a big car and being driven around and I'm swanky, I've got news for you. That is why I'm suffering as I am. Now, I am a preacher and a teacher of the gospel, and you'll find me in the jail. This is history to us. God knows whether it will become reality to a subsequent generation. I do believe if we are prepared to stand firm on the issues of human sexuality and on the issues of the absolute particularity of the person of Jesus Christ, pluralism will eventually do to us what it did to the Christians in the Roman Empire. Pluralism only accepts pluralists. As long as we are prepared to put our Christ in the pantheon amongst the other gods, they will tolerate us. But to the degree that we are prepared to stand up and say, at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow and every tongue confess that Jesus is Lord to the glory of God the Father, they say, we'll put your head in the ground and we'll set fire to you and pour tar on you. I'm suffering. The offense of the cross. But I'm not ashamed because I know whom I believe. I might be a prisoner, but I'm not a prisoner on account of fraud or manipulation or worming my way into people's homes or seeing godliness as a means to financial gain. No, I'm here on account of the gospel. Therefore, Timothy, verse 13, what I've been telling you, I want you to keep it. Keep it as the pattern. Let it be the model to you. 
Don't fiddle with it. Don't try and reconfigure it. This is it. Guard it. It's a good deposit. It's a beautiful deposit. How should you guard it? Not in a bombastic way. Guard it with faith and love. Some of us are good at guarding it in a very obnoxious kind of fashion. Very unattractive. He writes to Titus, he says, make the gospel of the Lord Jesus attractive in a generation that doesn't believe. So when we guard it, we do so with faith and with love. And the means provided is by the help of the Holy Spirit who lives in us. Do not be ashamed. That's the title of our message today from Alistair Begg. You're listening to Truth For Life, and in a moment, Alistair will conclude with prayer, so please keep listening. Today's message is part of a new series called Useful to the Master, and if you'd like to revisit any part of Alistair's teaching today, there is a complete transcript of this message available on our website at truthforlife.org. You can also purchase this entire series, Useful to the Master, on CD at our low cost without any markup. Again, go to truthforlife.org. The At Cost store on our website is part of our mission to bring clear, relevant Bible teaching to people all around the world. And it's made possible by the generosity of listeners like you. When you give toward the mission of Truth For Life today, we'd like to say thank you by inviting you to request a specially chosen resource from Truth For Life. It's written by Christian counselor Ed Welch, and it's titled Addictions. Believers aren't immune to addictions. Like everyone, our nature is sinful. We can find ourselves indulging in behaviors that become unhealthy, even holding us captive. Some addictions are fairly obvious, others are quite subtle, but all are damaging. Gratefully, God wants nothing more than to rescue us from these vicious cycles. But we can't get healthy until we face our sin. So if you or someone you care about has fallen into the trap of a desire that can no longer be controlled, Ed Welch offers a great deal of help. He takes you step by step through the process of identifying the root cause of addictive behavior, and then he guides your thoughts and your heart to realign with God's Word so you can experience healing and freedom. This book comes highly recommended by the team at Truth For Life. Request your copy when you donate today by calling 888 588-7884. That's 888-588-7884. Or if you prefer, you can give and request the book online at truthforlife.org. If you'd rather mail your gift, write to Truth For Life at P.O. Box 39 Cleveland, Ohio, 44139. Now, before we close, here's Alistair. Father, Out of an abundance of words, we pray that we might hear your voice. We pray that you would speak in the stillness, and as the rain falls upon the roof of this tent, so we pray that you will come and rain upon your people renewed convictions concerning the sufficiency of your word, the centrality of Christ, the necessity of the Spirit's power, and the immense privilege of joining with others in the cause of the gospel. Hear our prayers as we commit ourselves afresh to you in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. I'm Bob Lapine. Tomorrow, as we continue our study of 2 Timothy, Alistair describes how we can leave the legacy of the gospel for the next generation. Be sure to listen Wednesday. The Bible teaching of Alistair Begg is furnished by Truth For Life. Where the learning is for living.